Strange Shadows, a Clark Ashton Smith podcast. It has become needful for me, who am no wielder of the stylus of bronze or the pen of calamus, and whose only proper tool is the long, double-handed sword, to indict this account of the curious and lamentable happenings which foreran the universal desertion of Comorium by its king and its people. This I am well fitted to do, for I played a signal part in these happenings, and I left the city only when all the others had gone. Now, Comorium, as everyone knows, was aforetime the resplendent high-built capital and the marble and granite crown of all Hyperborea. But, concerning the cause of its abandonment, there are now so many warring legends and so many tales of a false and fabulous character that I, who am old in years and triply old in horrors, I, who have grown weary with no less than eleven lustrums of public service, am compelled to write this record of the truth ere it fade utterly from the tongues and memories of men. And this I do, though the telling thereof will include a confession of my one defeat, my one failure in the dutiful administration of a committed task. Greetings and welcome to Season 2, Episode 11 of Strange Shadows, the Clark Ashton Smith podcast. The voice you just heard to lead us in was Mr. Greg Johnson reading the opening paragraph of the story that we are going to be covering today. I'm one of your hosts, Tim Mendes. And I'm the other one, Rob Poynton. And yes, please do check out Greg's new YouTube channel where you can see him making all sorts of wondrous props and other items. A really enjoyable channel. We'll put the link up in the notes below. Please do check it out. Yeah, didn't he make the tilling cast resonator or something like that? He did, yes, and very good it looks as well. Yeah, so he's done that and a few other really fun projects. Nice. I just hope he didn't plug it in and got, like, blob monsters coming out of the ether, you know, because <laughs> that'd be a nasty way to go, I think. I think it was part of the device that he used for his short film. Uh, him and Chris Lackey made the, uh, the short From Beyond film. Ah. As a happy coincidence has it, we'll be screening at the Innsmouth Literary Festival, which, if you listen to this on the day of release will actually be occurring in real time. Yes, we'll be at the festival as you listen to this. Mm. Uh, so we'll do a full report on it afterwards, of course, and we're going to be releasing all the panels and our chat with Ramsey Campbell to our patrons as well. Yeah, at this time, as you're listening to this, I'm pro we're probably running around like idiots trying to find people or something like that, aren't we? <laughs> as opposed to sitting down like idiots. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right, so today's story, the testament of Af now. How are we how are we saying this? There's our first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you asked because I was going to ask this. I'm going for Athamaeus. Ah, now you see, yeah, that's it. That, we'll go with that. We'll go with Athamaeus because I thought, is it Athamaus? Is it Athamas? <laughs> yes, I guess each of those is viable. Athamos, Athamas, Athamos. Oh, God knows, but yeah. Well, I, I, I was really going from the uh, the follow up from the the sequel to this, which was uh, Rock Me Athenaeus, well, which was uh, a, a sort of modern take oh, on it. Oh, uh, so. oh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 it was completed on the 22nd of February, 1931, but he'd originally written the synopsis to it like almost a year earlier in 1930. And uh, yeah, it turned, Smith is obviously a fan of this one. He like, he, you know, because sometimes he's quite dismissive of his stories, but it looks like he actually really liked this one. And he wrote to Lovecraft that he would be rather peeved if Wright turns down the story since it is about as good as i can do in the line of unearthly horror so let me let me guess let me take a wild stab in the dark here right turned it down <laughs> yeah he wrote to smith on march the 21st that it is with real reluctance that i am returning the testament of athamaeus for it is an ingenious and well-told tale however our readers have shown a dislike for stories of cannibalism Adding, it may be, if the story remains vividly in my mind for six months, as did Sir Tampra Zeros, that I will sometime ask you to send me this again. Cannibalism. 
that's well we'll we'll talk about that as we get into it i guess but but it's, it, it's you don't see anything it's all off off screen i don't understand and i thought cannibalism was when you eat one of your own species well yeah there is that as well isn't there there is that yeah that that's a very very good point i didn't actually think of that but yeah um so smith then subbed it to strange tales but it was also rejected um <laughs> it's funny cuz lovecraft offers an assessment on this, on um, Wright rejecting it. It's kind of what you'd expect from HPL, right? Wright is, well, just old Farnsworth, eternally the same. <laughs> He'll be asking for Athamaeus all over again before long. It probably never occurred to him that the cannibalism connected with prehistoric anthropophagious monsters is something entirely different in its emotional implications from such realistic cannibalism as might occur among actual human beings in a contemporary setting. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. And Smith actually, he had a moan to August Derleth about it as well. He said, Wright seems to have lost what little nerve he ever had. He has returned to my two best horror tales on the plea that they will be too strong for his readers. I think, though, that he will take the testament of Athamaeus later on. It seems to have impressed him greatly, but Helmut Carby is quite beyond the pale. <laughs> That's Return of the Sorcerer, obviously. Right, right. This latter tale really seems to be something of a goat getter. <laughs> so, yeah, and uh, yeah, it did remain in Wright's mind, obviously. Uh, and he, <laughs> Smith eventually bragged to Donald Wondry, have I mentioned Wright's final acceptance of the Testament of Athamaeus a month after he had declined it? So there you go. <laughs> he took oh, he, it. He did, he did take it. He? he did indeed take it. Well, you think he'd have to be mad not to, because this is, uh, we're in Hyperborea, right? And it's a top-notch Hyperborean tale. It's quintessential Smith, isn't it? Yeah, it's got all the elements you need for a, a Smith tale and a weird story as well. So it's uh... yeah, it was um, it was published in the October nineteen thirty two issue and was voted the second favourite story in that issue, behind Jack Williamson's The Wand of Doom, which I have no idea what that is. I'm not but... familiar with? No, I'm not. We have been saying on the Innsmouth Book Club for some time. Uh, we need to look up some of these more obscure or less well known authors from weird yeah. tales. Perhaps that's a project for, for next year. Yeah. yeah. I've got a list of, like, because I've been collecting, haven't I? I'm, like, collecting the works of, like, our Robert Barlow and people like this, all these lesser-known members of the circle. So, yeah, be nice, maybe do, like, a, a loose series or something in the IBC. Yeah. Okay, so that's our publication history. Mm -hmm. Let's next move on to our favourite words. And I had quite a few for this one. Yeah, same. <laughs> a couple of which sent me down rabbit holes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to start then? Yeah, the first one was, the, it's, I think it's in like the first line or something. It's certainly in the first paragraph. Um, it mentions a calamus pen. Now, I looked into this. It's a Roman pen that was made of a reed. And it takes its name from the Greek god Calamos, but spelled with a K, um, who was the son of Meandros and the god of the Meandra River. Um, basically, the story tells of the love of two youths, Calamos and Carpos, and Carpos drowned in the river while the two were competing in a swimming contest. In his grief, Calamos allowed himself to drown also. He was then transformed into a water reed whose rustling in the wind was interpreted as a sign of lamentation. So there is basically... A lot of reed instruments, the Greeks use the term for various wind instruments. Um, yeah, Kalamos and the Romans, because the pen was made of reed. There you go. Ah, so we've got not only the writing implement, but that implication of, sort of fluting in there as well. Indeed. Yeah, <laughs> fluting and death, which is, which is never far away in a Clark Ashen Smith story, let's face it. The first one I'm going to go for is a word that I had to look up. Contumelious, which means to be insulting, insolent, or arrogant. Mm. Contumelious. And in fact, as I'm reading it now, I could see how that could be changed <laughs> very easily to be even more insulting. But <laughs> we, we won't go any further. On that. They just, I like that. <laughs> no, that's a good one. Uh, alabastrine is another one. This obviously comes from alabaster. I've just never heard alabastrine before. It's in terms of buildings being like white buildings. So there you go. 
and along similar lines it was a word that the the meaning was very obvious but was just yeah. a nice nice sound exudation oh exudation to, uh, yeah. to exude exude something now yeah another one was fulvous which is a dull orange or tawny brown another one i had to look up was flagitious which means villainous that was not a word i was familiar with at all hmm. no and that's no that's a new one on me as well yeah finally i had one i've heard before but i just love it feculent being filthy. <laughs> Can't go wrong with feculence. Nah, exactly. <laughs> a bit of feculence. And my last one, I think it's an old English word, actually, this one. I'm not quite sure of the pronouncing, but it's morgue, M-A-U-G-R-E, which simply means ill will or spite. Ah, nice. Again, another one I was totally unfamiliar with. Mm, yeah, there was a few in this. It, I've noticed this. It's Hyperborea tales and the um, Averroin as well tend to have the sort of richest most ar- like use of like archaic terminology and things yes. like that which yeah. really lends itself to the to the settings it does it fits the settings really well doesn't it and uh, even yeah. the the names of the characters uh, i mean the the Averroi well, we're going to have, well, have trouble with that <laughs> yeah, there's going to be some, we are going to have trouble with this there's going to be some yeah. piss pronunciations coming up i'm sure <laughs> yeah. we are going to struggle i was like as i was as i was going through i was like how am i supposed to say that <laughs> but yes we're in hyperborea and to be specific we're in Comorium, mm. which is the huge capital city now we have been in Comorium before and I thought this was interesting because if we cast our minds back to the Tower of Satanbrazeros, our two ne'er do wells in that story were in the ruins of Comorium, hunting the uh, Temple of Sothogua. So this is the story Pretty of. Cool, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's how Comoria became uh, deserted. Yeah. Although, funnily enough, I think in Satanbrazeros, they also mentioned the White Sibyl as well, yeah. which was another potential reason for. For Comorian being uh, being evacuated. Yeah, it's, it, what I found interesting because I was thinking when I was reading this, I was like, "Oh yeah," and that goes back. So I was, we'll get into it later, but I'm pretty sure that you know the formless spawn in that. That's got to be this guy, right? It sounds there, it there's sounds so many like similarities. It, it? Certainly, yeah. at one point, yeah. 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 So obviously, the story is told through the eyes of Athamaeus, who we learn is the chief executioner of Comorium, and this is his testament, his tale of why the city became deserted. Uh, At one time it was the resplendent high-built capital and the marble and granite crown of all Hyperborea. And uh, well, perhaps this accounts for our uh, story about the White Sibyl, because he does say, concerning the cause of its abandonment, there are now so many warring legends and so many tales of a false and fabulous character that I, who am old in years, and triply old in honours, I who have grown weary with no less than 11 lustrums of public service and compelled to write this record of the truth ere it fade utterly from the tongues and memories of men. So this is basically uh, an old man looking back and he wants to set the record straight. It's like you always get you get those the things when you have like disasters and stuff like that. The news media will talk complete and total nonsense about it, and then you'll get the guy going, hang on a minute, I was there, this is what happened. Yes. That's, that's basically this, isn't it? So he introduces himself as Athamaeus, the chief headsman of Ozulderum, who held formerly the same office in Comorium. His father, Mangai Thal, was headsman before me, and the sires of my father, even to the mythic generations of the primal kings. So this is the, uh, the family business going back generations. And I had to say, when I read Mangai Thal, that reminded me of the, the old pan books of horror edited by Herbert Van Thal. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> so he, he might have some Hyperborean blood in him, I don't know. <laughs> well, the, fir- the first thing that sprung to my mind thinking about this is that they, these guys, it's basically the um, Hyperborean equivalent of the Pierpoint family. Oh, of course, yeah. The Pierpoints were, were the, the executioners over here in the UK. Uh, they were a long line of executioners. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, to think of that as a family business, a family trade. Mm. But in a, in a sort of morbid way, that is a job that requires a certain level of skill, right? Whether you're, you're doing the old-fashioned way or hanging people. Well, yeah, because I, I mean, I remember reading something about, um, I think it was Alfred Pierpoint, 
and uh, so it, something had gone wrong with one of his executions, and the, the head came off. Right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Trigger warning for anyone. Who might hear it. <laughs> sorry, but you know it's us. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he was mortified because he brought shame to the the family tradition wow. because nobody had ever cocked it up. But it turned out it wasn't his fault. It was the it was the rope that he was given. It was a different type of rope. It was whoever had supplied the rope. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Talk about pr- taking pride in your work. <laughs> I know. It's, it's kind of, uh, well, no. why not, I suppose. A, a job well done is a job well done. Yeah. And he details how these executions are carried out using the great copper sword of justice on the block of Igon wood. So that's it. E-I-G-H-O-N, which is just a, a made-up Smith word. But it sounds good. And it's always italicised, isn't it? Did you notice that in the story? Yeah, I did. I noticed that later because I went down, at, I went on the internet trying to look up if that was a specific type of wood. And I spent ages and I was just like, he's made that up, hasn't he? That, that's not real. And then later you you, get, you figure it out because uh, it's mountains, isn't it? Yeah, because yeah, you have uh, the Iglophian mountains, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So that was interesting. I mean, historically speaking, Execution blocks were usually made of oak because that was considered the best wood. And they'd have a groove cut in them just under the neck for two reasons. One, because the blood would drain away better, but also because when the axe or sword came down, they didn't want it smacking straight into the, the wood and bouncing up again. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So you think about the precision required to make that cut is uh, yeah part of that skill. Well, I think anybody who's cut wood knows it's not as easy as you'd think. Yeah. You know, yeah. If you you know if you chop logs with an axe, you, you you'll know that it's not as easy as you think. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess most people would associate the headsman's block with an axe, mm. but in fact, a two-handed sword was used quite extensively in Europe, particularly in the 16th and 17th century. The sword was used a little bit in England, and this would be a big two-handed sword, but England tended to use the axe more. And in fact, if you go to the Tower of London. I believe you can still see the old headman's axe and the block. Mm, yeah. And uh, there's a, oh, well, I, I wouldn't say it was a nice little story, but this, I, I thought this was quite Smithian, actually. That axe in the Tower of London was last recorded as being used in 1747 for the execution of the Scottish baron and Jacobite Lord Simon Fraser of Lovett, who, as a Highlander, fought against the Hanoverian forces during the Battle of Culloden. So he was executed as a, a, a traitor, I guess. Mm, yeah. Uh, he uh, was imprisoned at the Tower of London. He apparently took the death sentence in his stride and was even able to maintain a dark sense of humour about the whole situation right up until the moment of his death. While standing on the public platform waiting for his execution, he apparently mocked the executioner <laughs> and laughed heartily at the irony of a commotion that had broken out among the crowd below as a wooden viewing stand collapsed, killing nine of the hundreds of spectators <laughs> who had gathered to jeer and watch his own death. Sir, we salute you. What a way to go. <laughs> it's, like, it's like the uh, the, the guillotine sequences in Carry On, Don't Lose <laughs> I Your Head. I knew you were going to mention those. <laughs> Did you? Right. <laughs> Put it in the basket. I'll read it later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> Marvellous, yeah, but I thought that was quite smithy and that, you know, people come to watch an execution and end up being killed. Yeah. Well, it's like a contest cruel, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. From there we get this nice description. Well, two descriptions, and I, I thought this worked very well. We get a description of the city. We've mentioned alabastine and heaven fretting spires and how opulent and magisterial the place is. And then we get the description of Athamaeus himself, who is now... Uh, his sinews have dwindled grievously. Time has drunken stealthily from my veins and has touched my hair with the ashes of sun's extinct. Isn't that lovely? Mm, yeah, lovely, lovely words. But in his day, he was quite the man and he seemed to have been very busy. There were a lot of bandits and robbers and thieves going on in the surrounding sort of forests and towns. Uh, he seemed to have no shortage of, of 
customers, shall we call them? <laughs> Clients, yeah. Clients. <laughs> yeah, I like that because he's talking about day, like his daily routine, isn't it? I stood each morning in the public square. You know, it's like that must have been, must have been a rough old town, Camorium. Yeah, we, you get you mention know. of police, don't you? And there's obviously law and order and the justice system. Mm. But uh, there seems to be plenty of, of wrongdoing going on. And it seems to me that the, the punishments are fairly harsh. But anyone get anyone who gets caught thieving takes a trip to the block. Yeah. And he even mentions each day the tough golden ruddy copper of the huge crescent blade was darkened not once but many times with a rich and wine like sanguine. And he is much honoured because of his skill, his never faltering arm and his infallible eye. Uh, and, and you hear stories, don't you, when people like uh, Mary was executed or those sort of people. They'd always tip the headsman to do a good job. Yeah. And there was one of them who had to be chased around, wasn't there, I think, at the Tower of London? Indeed. I can't yeah. remember. Was it La- Lady Jane Grey, perhaps, or someone? Oh, I think it was Lady Jane Grey. Yeah. yeah. He missed on the first blow when she got up and tried to run off, and it was quite a, oh, horrifying. Absolutely horrifying. Well, didn't they, didn't they have that thing at sort of some points in history over here that if somebody botched an execution... They were people were basically pardoned because it was seen as an act of God. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, th- I think that that actually happened on occasion, didn't it? Yeah. Particularly with the guillotine, perhaps. You know. Yeah, I think I think it was the guillotine, wasn't it? I think it. I think it was. I wonder if the execution of families staged protests at the invention of the guillotine. Yeah. I mean, that's almost like uh, you know industrialization, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's almost like the, you got the the luddites and all that. Yeah. It's almost like that, isn't it? <laughs> These machines are going to take over our jobs. And uh, I suppose it says something about the volume of executions that was going on during the French Revolution as well, that they needed something like that. Mm. Oh, isn't mankind wonderful? It is, it is. And this is where we're introduced to the villain of the piece, mm. who is uh, an outlaw, a reprehensible and very active outlaw by the name of Knigathin Zaum is my best guess at that. Yeah, I would have said Kingathin Kingathin Zaum. Yeah, I'll go with that. And this is where we start getting some law in, isn't it? L-O-R-E law. Mm-hmm. This person belonged to an obscure and highly unpleasant people called the Vurmis, who dwelt in the Black Eye Glophian Mountains at a full day's journey from Comorium and inhabited, according to their tribal custom, the caves of ferine animals less savage than themselves. So it's the Vormis, basically. Yeah, I love the Vormis. I've used the Vormis in a few of my things. Uh, in fact, the novel I wrote earlier this year has, because um, it's basically dystopian future. There's Lovecraftian races in it, so there's deep ones, and there's also Vormis that have sort of integrated into society. Uh, I like, what I love the most about them is the pun name of their home that <laughs> Smith came up with, Mount Vormithadreth. <laughs> yeah, that's so good <laughs> Vormi's address yeah, brilliant <laughs> that always sort of put me in mind of the Morlocks from, very uh, much so yeah from the time machine that's that's the image I have although the, the description is is given here but that's always the image I yeah I would go for the for the description I always get Chewbacca I always get Wookiees in my head oh, right. because of you know the umber coloured fur and, yeah. and all that and they're always quite stout chaps as well from what they gather you know though so this particular one is extremely Ophidian in uh, in look mm. and there's no surprises in this right it's Smith from the start there's it's it's very heavy hints about what this guy is or might be or is uh, shall we say sort of genetic makeup. Yeah, but well, you've got this lovely bit here. It just sets it out nicely. And it was commonly said that King Gathin Zalm himself possessed an even murkier strain of ancestry than the other Vormis, being related on the maternal side to that queer, non-anthropomorphic god Sarthogua, who was worshipped so widely during the subhuman cycles. And there were those who whispered of even stranger blood, if one could probably call it blood, and a monstrous linkage with the swart protean spawn that had come down with Sarthogua from elder worlds and exterior dimensions. Nice. So that's what I instantly thought. That's got to be the guy. That's got to be the guy. That's got to be the blob thing from Satan Zeros, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I connected the two in terms of them both being spawn of Sarthogua, but I never thought that is him. Yeah. That's it. That's the same one. 
perhaps at some point he was imprisoned in that or everyone fled and he just moved into that temple. Well, at the right at the end, as we'll see, he this like Athamaeus is like the last chap to leave, isn't he? And it's yeah. sort of sitting there. So Camorium is basically empty with old <laughs> what's his face? King Gaffin Zaum. KZ. KZ. <laughs> with old KZ um, sort of hanging out on the execution block. So Oh, that's marvellous. I, yeah, I was say, I, that's what I, I in my head does sort of put it together. I was like, ooh, this is basically a prequel. <laughs> and also like that so specific thing there, uh, on the maternal side, <laughs> it's related on the maternal Yeah, I like, that's what I love about Smith. He drops in those little asides, doesn't he? That is always something like that, some kind of almost innocuous comment, but it just adds some depth to it somehow. Well, it does, and it also has very unpleasant implications as well, doesn't it? Doesn't it just rumpy with a big toad god? Oh, yeah. you had to say it. I had to say it. Of course I did. It's me. <laughs> I, I, I would have said it if you... <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so KZ has been basically raiding and thieving throughout the area, and he seems to be getting bolder and bolder, and he descends on a village so near Camorium that it was usually classed as a suburb. Here, he and his feculent crew committed numerous deeds of an unspecifiable enormity and bearing with them many of the villagers for purposes even less desirable they retired to their caves in the Iglophian peaks so this is the point where authorities say right enough is enough he's virtually raiding Camorium itself now we need to capture him and this takes a little while there's all sorts of raids and, and parties go out looking for him but he manages to evade them all until he is eventually taken in broad daylight on the highway near the city's outskirts. And it's rather curious because he makes no resistance at all. It's almost like he wants to be captured. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. And the fact that he's all together alone, whereas usually he's ran with like a, a pack. So obviously when you have this kind of villain, especially in pre-media days, uh, uh, stories would have been circulated or an image is built up. And, you know... I imagine uh, this guy would have been eight foot tall when he's got eyes of fire and all that kind of stuff that you'd... Those would be the stories told. Oh, yeah. So Athamaeus is kind of expecting that, well, the stories are going to be exaggerated. But when he first see him, he's actually surprised to see that Zalm surpassed the most sinister and disagreeable anticipations. is actually worse than the stories. Mm-hmm. He was naked to the waist and wore the fulvous hide of some long-haired animal, which hung in filthy tatters to his knees. Such details, however, contributed little to those elements in his appearance, which revolted and even shocked me. His limbs, his body, his lineaments were outwardly formed like those of Aboriginal man, and one might even have allowed for his utter hairlessness, in which there was a remote and blasphemously caricatural suggestion of the shaven priest, and even the broad formless mottling of his skin like that of a huge boa, might somehow have been glossed over as an extravagant peculiarity of pigmentation. It was something else. It was the unctuous, verminous ease, the undulant lightness and fluidity of his every movement that seemed to hint at an inner structure and vertebration that were less than human. That's a great description, isn't it? I, lo I love the, the different... Um the different descriptors he uses there because you've got verminous and you've got ophidian it's a wormy snake like lots of slithery writhing things you know squirming that's a kind of you sort of you can picture it can't you you can see this lolloping guy sort of squirming into the room and it, it does make you sort of you know <laughs> it does and it, it is the way he walks and, and everything about him is something I don't know, less or more than human but unhuman I guess it's, it's like his, his inner constructions uh, not human. And I just picked up on that priest thing there. As you, uh, yeah. You, you sort of mentioned that. So here's a, a theory, given what happens at the end. They were stealing villages for some sort of ritual. He is their high priest, and he's basically this ritual is going to turn him into what he becomes or, or is uh, a, a bit like a deep one transformation, perhaps. That's an interesting speculation, yeah. That is an interesting speculation. I like that. And perhaps part of it is he, he has to be killed to sort of shed his skin, if you like, and move on to the next stage. Yeah, to keep with the sort of snake-like motif. Yeah, very, yeah. That's a really good thought, actually. 
But all that aside, he's thrown in an oubliette, which is another great word. I love an oubliette. <laughs> no home should be without one. <laughs> <laughs> You've got three bedrooms, a bathroom, and uh, of course the oubliette. <laughs> an ensuite oubliette. <laughs> And is sent to trial, and judgment is passed. The judge, the sentence is death. Of course, uh, normally they take a couple of weeks to execute people, which is probably because of the backlog, I guess. But uh, this guy is special. They're only going to wait three days. I wonder if it's like over here. We had that like the first clear Sunday thing. You know, you'd be that was a thing, wasn't it? You'd be executed on the first clear Sunday. So you wake up every every Sunday, go, please rain, please rain. All right. <laughs> Wow, that's crazy. The morning of the execution arrives, um, and Athamaeus has been troubled by abominable dreams. But they don't put him off. He's as punctual as ever. He's got his block, which is situated with geometrical exactness in the centre of the main square. The crowd has gathered. We've got the sun blazing down. We've got court dignitaries, merchants, artisans. Everyone's there, basically. I thought about this... Um... Yeah, so we've got the ultimate death metal release here. The album is Abominable Dreams, <laughs> and the band name from an earlier paragraph is Mephitic Icor. Oh! Mephitic Icor presents Abominable Dreams. Oh! <laughs> Back of the net, sir, with that one. Back of the net, yes. <laughs> KZ is brought in, Zaum is brought in, and is surrounded by a huge entourage of guards with bill hooks and lances and tridents. It's quite specific about a lot of the weaponry in this, isn't he, as well? I, know, I just know, as a fellow fan of the uh, Four Candles sketch, you will have raised a smile at bill hooks. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, one of the games on a Monday night at Bedford Gladiators is called Never Mind the Bill Hooks at the moment. Yeah, nice. Medieval skirmish. Yeah. <laughs> so that's it. Zaun comes in. He, he seems very nonplussed, very unperturbed. He presents his mottled nape without a tremor, mm. and the deed is done. And we get this this nice little touch as well. Well, again, not nice, quite gruesome, but uh, no, it's quite grisly actually. Yeah. <laughs> Neck stiffer in the sensations which they have fought to one's hand beneath the penetrating blade. In this case, I can only say that the sensation was not such as I have grown to associate with the cleaving of any known animal substance. So even the feel of his flesh is different. But nonetheless, the head falls off and uh, there's not really any blood, is there? No. I like this. It was a feeling of a loathsome underlying plasticity an invertebrate structure, nauseous and non-terrestrial, beneath his impious mockery of human form. Mm. Yeah, it's yeah. Again, it's just that, that uncanny, otherworldly, strange. You know. And this is where we get the first mention of the ooze as well, mm. because if we said there's no blood, only a black, tarry, fetid exudation, far from copious. So there's that initial idea of the. The formless spawn, I guess. Yeah. Perhaps that's like the 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 young one or the little baby one within him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was brought what brought to mind was um, a Wilbur Waitley. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, that it brought me to mind that because obviously, you know, outwardly he looked sort of almost like a normal person, but then he was a uh, inside <laughs> this giant blob monster basically you know yes with tentacles and hooves and yeah eyes at your hips and all sorts of stuff so that's basically it he thinks job done he he receives the applause of the waiting multitudes and then uh he basically goes home and has a has a glass of wine <laughs> and a slap up meal <laughs> <laughs> i retired that night after a bounteous meal of savannah fruit and dijonga beans well irrigated with foam wine <laughs> yeah, but he is troubled by these dreams again. Caco demonical dreams. <laughs> he describes them. Mm, nice. That could be the follow-up album. <laughs> and there's nothing specific in these dreams, right? It's more just a feeling, uh, a monotonously cumulative horror without shape or name, and the ever torturing sentiment of vain repetition and dark, hopeless toil and frustration. And this struck home because I don't know if you ever have this situation when you've got a bit of a cold or a fever. We've both said this here. You tend to have these dreams where you're doing the same thing over and over again. Oh, yeah. 
and, and nothing like you're trying to put things in boxes or something and it just seems to repeat and repeat and repeat i always have the dreams of like work dreams right uh it's like when i was a chef but it was always go, doing something mundane but then something w- that was supposed to be there wasn't there and you keep mm. doing it over and over again and it just getting worse and worse and worse because you couldn't find your fucking meat tenderizer or some shit something stupid <laughs> like that you'd have an end up having a nightmare about a meat tenderizer you know <laughs> it's the weirdness of the subconscious isn't it yes meat tenderizer <laughs> Tim has a meat tenderizer. <laughs> I'm just leaving. <laughs> Would you like to meet my meat tenderizer? I, I actually have several <laughs> in my in my toolbox of knives and all the chef equipment, chef paraphernalia. Yeah. yeah, we should point out to any new listeners that Tim is a chef. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's not Leatherface. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's not the South Coast serial killer. <laughs> So it's all tickety boo, everything as well. He, he puts the uh, dreams down to the the, the junga beans, <laughs> <laughs> which is quite nice. Yep. And he's off out the next day. He's, he's got a quiet day the next day. There's only three criminals of quite average sort. Uh, he can't even remember them. They're they're so uh, nondescript and unimportant. He can't even remember them. But as he's making his way back, there's a bit of a commotion going on. There's been a bit of a kerfuffle, and it seems that Panathin Zaum is back. Is seized a respectable seller of the Dronga beans and have proceeded instantly to devour his victim alive without heeding the blows, bricks, arrows, javelins, cobblestones, and curses that were rained upon him by the gathering throng and by the police. <laughs> so he's strolling back from the grave, casually eating someone alive in broad daylight, and has been captured again. Yeah, it's the sheer, the sort of nonchalance of the whole thing, isn't it? It's just there's a purpose to this. This is why I think you might be going on the, on the right track there with the, you know, it's part of the ritual, isn't it? It has to be. It's almost like, you know, it's too precise mm. to just be random act. It's just like, no, I'm going to die and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to eat somebody. And then, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it does seem very calculated, doesn't it? Mm, exactly. And I love this bit about how this caused, obviously there's the, the upset of the guy being eaten alive in the town square. But there seems to be more of an upset about the law here and the legal considerations, because how can you charge someone with murder when they've already been executed? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which I suppose comes back a little bit to what you were saying earlier about if the guillotine doesn't work, oh, well, off you go. Yeah. You know? Well, it's like the double jeopardy law in the States, isn't it? Yeah. You can't be tried for the same thing twice and all that. So they, they have to change the law, right? They, they have to pass a special statute mm. calling for rejudgment and allowing for re-execution. That's a, an interesting legal issue there. I don't suppose it'll ever be put to put to the test in British law, but you never know. <laughs> if there's a, a zombie outbreak, what happens then? Do you, do you charge the zombies with killing people? Oh, now you could have some fun with that, couldn't you, in a story? You could have some fun with that. There's, there's a story. Yeah. yeah, zombie in the dock. That'd be the title, Zombie in the Dock. Almost sort of almost Charles Stross esque, you know, bureaucracy in the face of, you know, legal, legal jargon and zombies. <laughs> you can have some real fun with that. Yeah, and I worked in the court system for a while. I actually worked at a Crown Court. Oh, nice. And it's every bit as Byzantine and uh, intricate and complicated as you can be. Yeah. Mixed with this contrast of, you know, in some cases, absolutely horrendous acts and crimes. Mm. It's this real peculiar mix of uh, the, the, the sort of worst of humanity, if you like, and then the, the finest legal minds trying to either defend or prosecute that. Strange place, really, to work. It is. It, it's like when, you, when you, I've been, like, uh, done jury duty and stuff like that, and I've also been in court and things like that, you know, from, <laughs> as witnesses <laughs> and stuff, right? That would just put that there. You mean you weren't the Suffolk Strangler? <laughs> no, Exactly. <laughs> Oh dear! <laughs> You're digging your own hole here. <laughs> I am, yeah, yeah, I am, yeah. But there's there's sort of always something faint, slightly faintly surreal and almost ridiculous about the situation. Yeah, when you got you know and, and the, the robes and, 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 and you know all the all the sort of rituals that go on. 
And then you got some meathead being brought in, dragging the knuckles, you know, who's just, you know, who's driven driven a car into an off license or something. Do you know? <laughs> you know, the, I grew up in Manchester. <laughs> so well, no, we, we, we had exactly the same down in East London. So yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah it's a strange thing. We, we used to laugh at the statements being read out sometimes because they're read in that voice, you know, yes. that very English voice. And yeah. I approached the defendant, and she said to me. F off, you see. In this, uh, yeah, you know, exactly. That so, yeah. Always... That's it. It's faintly surreal, isn't it? It's strange. And you get that in this story, which I think is quite nice and quite accurate. Yeah, yeah. And I also liked here that Athamaeus, we, we have this um, scientific view from him. Again, this uh, mm. rejection of the supernatural, because he says, as for me, my, my scientific turn of mind, which repudiated the supernatural, let me to seek an explanation of the problem in the non-terrestrial side of Pnigathin Zaum's ancestry. I felt sure that the forces of an alien biology were somehow involved. So there we get this nice Lovecraftian twist of the monster isn't a supernatural monster, it's extraterrestrial. Well, that's why I would definitely put this as part of the, the mythos, pretty much, because it, it does feel like a mythos story. I mean, I think Smith did put it on the list, didn't he? Of the ones that he would consider part of right. that thing. Right. Well, it, it's got Sarthogua in it, you know. So oh, Sarthogua came to Earth from Saturn, right? Which I don't think was the home, it wasn't the home planet, was it? But that was a, a sort of stop off on the way, wasn't it? So yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. And uh, of course, they check out the grave. I, I, I can almost see this for one of those old uh, sort of Hammer films or the Amicus or um, mm. the Roger Coleman films with that cemetery again. You know, and that uh, that grave digger, <laughs> and that grave digger, yeah. Joe something, I yeah. think his name was. Yeah, and the earth had not been disturbed apart from a deep hole at one end of the grave, such as might have been made by a large rodent. So again, that notion that something unhuman or inhuman has dug its way out from the grave. And so again, when we were talking about Smith and the, the little details, there's another great little detail here when they were moving all the loose soil that it was mingled with potsherds and other rubbish. Mm. So they'd obviously like filled it in with all the, you know, all the crap. I just thought there's a nice... Because then they say it's not buried in the posh cemetery. or anything. Exactly. It's yeah. put on the waste ground out. Like the waste, it's... Yeah, that's basically yeah. what you get the idea, that it was, it was almost like a rubbish tip kind of thing, you know. Mm, nice. It's, yeah, I missed that. Yeah. yeah. So they think, okay, is some sort of uh, whatever. We'll cut his head off again, and this time we'll put him in a better box, and we'll put a load of boulders on top. That should do the trick. <laughs> there is there is a natural question that arises here, but I'll, I'll save that to the end. Yeah, yeah. They're going to put him in a strong wooden sarcophagus, which is going to be inhumed, inhumed, nice word, in a deep pit in the solid stone, and the pit filled with massy boulders. So we get another execution scene, and, and this time he notices some differences in sound. Mm -hmm. The huge splotches of dull black and sickly yellow that had covered him from head to heel were now somewhat differently distributed. The shifting of the facial blotches around the eyes and mouth had now given him an expression that was both grim and sardonic to an unbearable degree. So there's that knowing quality again, isn't it? I know what's happening. Yeah, cut me head off. We'll be fine. There was also a perceptible shortening of his neck, which I thought was a nice touch. Though the place of cleavage and reunion midway between head and shoulders had left no mark whatsoever. And look at him, looking at his limbs, I discerned other and more subtle changes. Yeah, see, you get the um, you get the impression that he's even more weird. So it is almost like an evolution, isn't it? It's like he's evolved after this apparent demise. It's going towards something here. This is a purposeful change. Yeah. This is not a case of uh, his body is decomposed a bit or something like that. This is something something else. No. So, bang, head comes off again. And I love this. Uh, the head rolled forward on the Igon wood, and the torso and its members fell and lay supinely on the maculated flags. Hey, Smith doesn't just say flagstones, does he? Maculated flags. No. And this, this sentence, I think, is my favourite in the whole story. From a legal viewpoint, this doubly nefandous malefactor was now twice dead. <laughs> it's good, brilliant. Doubly nefandous. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> nefandous malefactor. Could be an industrial band. 
that's uh yeah yeah we're getting more into yeah Einstein's end of territory yeah now. exactly yeah <laughs> So there we go. It takes three men to lift the least of the boulders. He's in a big sarcophagus. He's got boulders on top. End of story. Nope. He comes back with a vengeance. This time, he eats one of the judges and not satisfied with picking the bones of this rather obese individual, had devoured by way of dessert the more outstanding facial features of one of the police who had tried to deter him from finishing his main course. So quite grim and gruesome again, but yeah. always with that underlying humour, the way it's written is quite sort of light and, and humorous, isn't it? It is, yeah. Yeah, it's like this line here. It's, it's almost black comedy, isn't it? After a final nibbling at the scant vestiges of the unfortunate constable's left ear, KZ had seemed to experience a feeling of repletion and had suffered himself to be led docilely away once more by the jailers. <laughs> it's just it's like a final nibbling. So it's 2 nil to KZ at the moment. <laughs> mm. And now they think, well, I thought the interesting thing here was that this already starts having effects on the populace, and the more superstitious and timid already begin leaving the city. Uh, are they timid or are they smart? Do they see what's coming? Again, it's what we say, so... Um, in a lot of these stories, isn't it? These apparent, like, rustics or whatever, they know more than... They know what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true, yeah. And the religious people start making more sacrifices. That was the other yep. interesting thing as well. But he says again, he was a able to wholly disregard all that nonsense. But the persistent return of Zalm was no less alarming to science than to religion. So he's still on this sort of science kick. Which I think is quite refreshing in these kind of stories because usually, in the, the these the sort of stories like in this kind of like long past setting, they they tend to be sort of superstitious or yeah. you know, yeah. what's that closed minded to sort of science and things like that. This guy is a very rational, forward thinking chap by the sounds of it. So they're taking no chances this time. They're going to execute him straight away. Seems like almost pretty much on the spot. Athenaeus is summoned, and again, he notices this change, this new recrudescence. Zalm has undergone a most salient change. His mottling had developed more than a suggestion of some startling and repulsive pattern, and his human characteristics had yielded to the inroads of an unearthly distortion. Yeah. The head is now joined to the shoulders. The eyes are diagonal. There's bulgings and flattenings. Basically, is becoming more and more serpentine. Yeah. I wondered here with this, because this put me in mind of Robert E. Howard's Serpent People with King Cole and Volusia and all that stuff. Uh, so, again, maybe a little nod to Robert E. Howard there as well, perhaps. Oh, and I like the kneecaps. Did you pick, pick that one up? <laughs> yes, indeed. I shall, however, mention the strange pendulous formations like annulated dewlaps or wattles into which his kneecaps had evolved. Yeah. That's a bit, ugh, isn't it? You know? <laughs> that's mm. horrible, isn't it? <laughs> it's like bingo wings on your knees. Yeah, so. that's quite a thing to try and picture that, isn't it? Strange, yeah. yeah. That's what I've always loved about Smith, though. It's, it's like, it's weird fiction with a capital W. Yeah. It's like you've mentioned several times before in the past about like, when you go to alien planets, they're not just men in rubber suits. These are properly alien. Yeah, they, they've got eight limbs and six eyes and they're all these different colours and they're insectoid and all sorts of mm. things. Yeah. And you've got the same thing going on here with this chap. It's like with each time he comes back, he's more and more other. Yeah, yeah. And this now is really testing Athamaeus' skill because the guy's got no neck. Mm. Uh, how do you do a decapitation when there's no neck? He's got to be really super precise. And he it, it, it seems to be quite concerned about this. I, I guess it's like you mentioned earlier with, with the guy there. Yeah. Because he doesn't want the decapitation to become a dismemberment. That's a, sort of a, a mark on his on his skill, isn't it, I guess? You know? Yeah, it's that professional pride thing is that we discussed, isn't it? It's very strange, yeah. but... Uh... Yeah, I like it. I like I like the way. Again, it's just the little details that make the story. Because I mean, you, you could quite easily have just gone, "Yeah, we had to execute him again." I put him down. I lopped off his head. Yeah. The fact that he mentions this thought process <laughs> is what brings the character to life, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So this time we've got a strong sarcophagus of bronze, 
The head is going in a smaller sarcophagus of the same material. The lids are soldered down with molten metal. And then the two sarcophagi uh, basically put in opposite sides of the city. One, the body is at great depth beneath monumental masses of stone. And the head they leave out, but they post a guard around it. In fact, they post guards around both uh, sections, both the head and the body. I thought this was a nice detail here. The sarcophagus containing the head was once one that had been primarily designed for the reception of a small child. Its present use, one might have argued, was a sinful and sacrilegious waste of fine bronze, but nothing else of proper size and adequate strength was available at the time. So that's a nice touch. That's quite poignant, isn't it, as well? No. Yeah. And uh, we're back into the weapons with this as well. I did like this line, because he's, he's obviously going to stand watch with the guards over the head. For weapons, I myself wore a short falchion and carried a great bill. I thought falchion and bill sounded like a 70s cop show. <laughs> Or an undertaker's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fauci and Bill. <laughs> and uh, again, this is so well observed because we've got these guards. They've uh, stuck torches in the flagstones of the court. So you can picture this scene. They're all standing around this box or this bronze chest with the torchlight. And what do they do? What guards do in all of these stories? They're standing around. Someone gets the wine <laughs> flask out. Someone gets the mammoth ivory dice out and they start drinking and rolling dice. But yep. the pazores. <laughs> Gambling. Yeah. I like the fact that, uh, yeah, I, not, I know not how many stars had gone over us in the smoky heavens, nor how many times I had availed myself over the ever circling bottles. But I remember well that I'd won no less than 90 pazores from the trident bearers, who were all swearing lustily and loudly <laughs> as they strove in vain to stem the tide of my victory. It sounds like a right old knees up, you know? Yeah, 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 they're having a good time, which is interrupted by a, a sort of rattling sound. Mm. And I think this, this is then what put me in mind. We, we mentioned the return of the sorcerer earlier, right? So this is like the head in the cupboard banging on the door. Exactly. That's, yeah. It's funny that these, these stories were so close together. Mm. Smith obviously liked that image, didn't he? <laughs> and the sound here is like a smitten gong or shield because it's in this, uh, it's in this bronze box. Yeah, and, and the box itself is flipping about and dancing and pirouetting, clanging resonantly all the while on the granite pavement. And then things get worse. Yeah. So it's bulging ominously at the top and sides and bottom and was rapidly losing all similitude to its rightful form. Its rectangular outlines swelled and curved and were horribly erased as in the changes of a nightmare till the thing became a slightly oblong sphere. And then with a the most appalling noise, it began to split at the welded edges of the lid and burst violently asunder. Through the long ragged rift there poured in hellish ebullition a dark, ever swelling mass of, of incognizable matter frothing as with the venomous foam of a million serpents Love nice it. so there's our formless spawn in all its glory and i think when we consider that that first beheading there was a little trickle now we've got this sounds like a, a fair sized mass doesn't it yeah so it does feel to me like the thing is growing each time yeah uh, and it uh, it rolls towards them they all leap back and it forms like a, a, a ball or almost like a head shape, a round blackish ball on whose palpitating surface the nascent outlines of random features were limbed with the flatness of a drawing. There was one lidless eye, tawny, pupilless, and phosphoric that stared upon us from the centre of the ball while the thing appeared to be making up its mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite disconcerting, isn't it? If the, mm. Imagine if the thing rotates and the eye fixes on you. <laughs> oh, God. With brown trousers time, wouldn't it? You'd point into the bloke next year, wouldn't you? Him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> With that old, uh, that old chestnut about the, the two wildlife photographers, <laughs> the lion outside the tent, one putting the trainers on, would be that again, yeah. wouldn't it? <laughs> and I'm just thinking if they did this as a film, you know, one of the guards will be saying, oh, my last night before I retire... And move off to my place in the country with the grandkids. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm too old for this shit. <laughs> so the thing bounds off, springs past them, and it's off and away into the streets. 
Uh, of course, they give chase, and you get this nice chase scene throughout the city, which causes quite a clamour. <laughs> and they hear a similar clamour coming from the other side of the city, approaching them, because, as we might expect, the two parts are going to join up at some point. And this search actually goes on till daybreak, right? It's, um, but the search was in vain, and the stars grew faint above us in a livid sky. And the dawn came in among the marble spires with a glimmering of ghostly silver and a thin phantasmal amber was sifted on walls and pavements. Other people would have just wrote, the sun came up. But there we go. That's peak Smith again. Yeah, it's that poetry again, isn't it? And I like this way the city starts coming to life. There's, there's like milkmen and fruit sellers mm. start coming out and all that sort of thing. And then in a town square in which was the Igon block on which so many thousand miscreants had laid there, Piacula next. There's a word I missed. Piacula. I have to check that one. Rhymes with Dracula. <laughs> we heard an outcry of mortal dread and agony, such as the only one thing in the world could have occasioned. It's there. Zalm has come, and now he's uh, is in full sort of uh, formless spawn mode, I suppose you call it. Mm. And it's quite a graphic description. We, we, we get that old uh, sort of stereotype of Lovecraft and his ilk not describing anything, but this is a full-on description. I particularly like the fact that uh, other and even more shocking alterations had occurred. The arms had lengthened into tentacles with fingers that were like knots of writhing vipers, and where the head would normally have been, the shoulders had reared themselves to a cone-shaped eminence that ended in a cup-like mouth. Ugh. Yeah. Most fabulous and impossible of all, however, were the changes in the nether limbs. At each knee and hip, they had rebifurcated into long, lithe proboscides that were lined with throated suckers. By making a combined use of its various mouths and members, the abnormality was devouring both of the hapless persons whom it had seized. That is a, yeah, a very strange being, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, we get that sort of shogothy kind of feel. You mentioned Wilbur Wade mm. before. Well, the formless spawn is very similar, isn't it, to the old Shoggoth? Yeah, yeah. sort of proto-plastic. Proto-Shoggoth, yeah. So, obviously, he's leading all the guards and the soldiers, and they surround the thing. But they, they, they've got lances and tridents, but they don't really want to stab in because there's a couple of people meshed in with this. So, yeah. they, they sort of wait a bit until those people are trained of blood and dead. <laughs> and then they're going to attack it. They are. They're definitely going to go and attack it. And it sort of rears up on the uh, execution block. Plainly, the monster had grown weary of all such trifling and would no longer submit himself to the petty annoyance of human molestation. As we raised our weapons and made ready to strike, the thing drew back, still carrying its vein-drawn, flaccid victims, and climbed upon the Igon block. Here, before the eyes of all assembled, it began to swell in every part, in every member, as if it were inflating itself with a superhuman rancor and malignity. So this thing now starts swelling out. And uh, at that point, I think the soldiers think, so this, we're a game of soldiers. Yeah. You can imagine the clatter of the tridents being dropped and they're off. And then the, the stomp of feet, heavy booted feet as they leg it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the general population follows. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. I like that. I like the way you sort of do, and it mentions here that it began to bulge aggressively towards us with a slow, interminable stretching of boa-like arms. It's you know the the, the arms. It's like that classic scene from hey. A Nightmare on Elm Street, where Freddy Krueger's arms start get growing after he's chasing Tina down that alleyway. Yeah, yeah, and I, I get a sense of the thing as well, right? That, yeah, that kind of it starts as a small. Thing, but then <laughs> it becomes a big thing. <laughs> Small thing to big thing. And it starts making a noise as well. That was, uh, that was a nice touch. Mm. Uh, as you can imagine, all the, the populace are, are shouting and screaming Yeah, uh, as they start to run off. Their flight was no doubt accelerated by the vocal sounds, which for the first time during our observation were being emitted by the monster. These sounds partook of the character of hissings more than anything else but their volume was overpowering. Their timbre was a torment and a nausea to the ear. And worst of all, they were issuing not only from the diaphragmatic mouth, but from each of the various other oral openings or suckers which the horror had developed. So I'm, I'm getting that sound of like that multiple voice screaming thing. Yeah. 
that you, you often get it with the demonic possession, don't you? Where they, they play the voice several times at different pitches to make it sound really mm. strange. And I get that. Yeah. And interesting because I'm pretty sure I'll have to go back and check, but I'm pretty sure I remember in the Tale of Tamprazeros that the formless spawn made a weird hissing noise. That does that does sound familiar. Mm. Yeah, but we, we can check on that. Or, or perhaps one of our listeners will, will know. So that's basically it. Even Athamaeus draws back from this, takes himself well beyond reach. And uh, he does linger for a little bit. He's proud to say that he lingers on the edge of the empty square. And the thing that had been Nagathin Zalm, seemingly content with its triumph, brooded supine and mountainous above the vanquished Igon block. And uh, it seems to just settle down. It, it ignores him, really. And I thought that was like a, almost a contempt, wasn't it? You're not even worth messing with, mate. Just, You're not yeah. even worth chasing, yeah. Well, that's why, to me, it's like, because obviously the last we see of this is Athamaeus leaving Camorium and this blob, basically, is sitting on the execution block, like, saying, come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. And then September Zeros, they go to this, the deserted city, and the only thing there is this big amorphous blob. Uh, like, to me, you know, it, it's got to be the same blob, hasn't it? It's got to be the same one, hasn't it? Hmm. Yeah, it's just very hard. I never connected that, you know. I thought, oh, formless spawn, formless spawn. Oh, of course it's the same one. It's got to be. Yeah, it's got to be. Yeah, and I liked uh, Athamaeus's sort of, uh, you know, he's got reason enough to leave. Every, everyone's fled. He's standing on his own in front of a huge blood monster. But he, he sort of rationalises it in that, uh, well, Camorium is obviously now entirely without a king, a judicial system, a constabulary, or people. So I finally abandoned the Doom City and followed the others. It's like, well, there's no more duty for me to perform here. I think I'll leave as well. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? He's got it's this pride thing again. <laughs> I don't know if it's just me, me like, being British, right? He seems a bit of a jobsworth, you know. <laughs> Did you see what I mean? It's just like, I couldn't possibly leave without... <laughs> my shift doesn't end for another 10 minutes. Yeah, it's that sort of thing. It reminded me of it just before uh, we started today. I watched a little clip from A Bridge Too Far about uh, the attack on Arnhem, where they dropped paratroopers on Arnhem in World War II. Yeah. And there's one scene, the British powers are totally surrounded, totally outnumbered, and a German guy comes up with a white flag and says, we've come to talk about surrender. And the, the British major or whatever, he goes, uh, uh, awfully sorry, old chap, we don't have enough room to take you all prisoner. <laughs> <laughs> Was there anything else? <laughs> it's that the British thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah that struck me as that, like this guy a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So, there we go. The testament of Amatheus. Amatheus. Oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, a bloody good story. Oh. I love it. It's one of my favourites. Yeah. Next, I had the, the Hyperborea paperback the panther i think i think it was a panther yeah the panther um, ones, yeah. yeah that was always my favorite of the clark ashton smith books that i had um like years going back 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 as a kid um yeah something about the hyperborea stories i think is my f- the favorite of the cycles it does seem to come alive in those isn't it i think we've got the the modern ones and the sci-fi ones are probably the least um ornate in terms of their language I, I guess for good reason. Yeah. And I think the Zothite ones have a, they're more sort of decay and necromancers, aren't they? They have more of that sort of. Yeah, they are. Yeah. 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 And then I think obviously like a close second would be the sort of Averroin in terms of the language. Cause again, you've got that sort of very flowery descriptions and things like that. I think, that, I think as well, it, it's always, I think it's a case that these are the stories that Clark Asher Smith likes writing. Yes. He likes writing the Hyperborea stories. He likes writing the Averroin stories. And he likes writing the Zothic stories. He's not that keen on writing sci fi. I mean, because when he talks to Lovecraft in the letters, it's always kind of der- in a derisory term, isn't it? It's always like, oh, science fiction again. I need some cash, <laughs> kind of thing. You yeah, know? I, 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 some of them totally with that, isn't it? He, he mm. said as much. I can't remember which one. It was the only one that we didn't particularly like, but Smith agreed. This, we agreed with Smith. Yeah. Uh, it was a bit of a churn out job for twenty dollars or whatever it was. Yeah, it just needed to pay the bills, which I think you get. I mean, you know, you're a job in writer, you gotta pay the bills. Well yeah, but isn't this thing we we've totally said before, if you've got a story like this which is top tier and that gets rejected, 
Mm. But had he written one of those uh, Volmar stories or something, that probably would have got been accepted straight away. Yeah. And you just think, well, I don't know. We we sound like we're picking on Farnsworth right a bit at times, but it is difficult to understand the thought process there from my perspective. Yeah, well, I think I, think I do understand to a degree, but what I think what always trips me, because obviously I, I understand, like, because I've done curation, you yourself, you have as well, you edit anthologies and things like this. You want to take the best things for that. But as of, you know, if Clark Ashton Smith submitted to us, we take it because it's the sort of thing we're looking for. I think what I don't really get about Farnsworth Wright is the fact that it's called Weird Tales, <laughs> which would imply to me that you want stories that are weird, right? And they're the ones that he seems to reject. <laughs> What's weirder about a weird snake-like shogothy thing that eats people in the city, and uh, yeah. and again, there's no happy resolution, which is the other the other stock trade of the weird tale, right? Exactly. Like, nothing's yeah. particularly explained. There's no happy ending to it. Yeah, it's got, it's got weird tale, like you say, with the capital W all over it, and and a cannibalism thing. KZ is obviously not human. Well, quite obviously, yeah. Well, for a start, he's but he's before me. Which is not human. It's not, yeah. Well, even, yeah. Even from the start, it's not human. I don't see how that is cannibalism. If uh, if I'm eaten by a snake, which, you know, yeah. we did have a snake in the garden once, but it was an adder and it was about six inches long. So I wasn't in too much danger. It did give me a bit of a jump, to be fair. That's not classed as cannibalism, is it? That's me being eaten by a snake. So I, I don't really get... It's a strange argument, isn't it? <laughs> Perhaps he just skim read it or something. Mm, I don't know. Yeah. Perhaps he just opened it up, put his finger on the page, and said, "Oh, someone gets eaten." Or oh, don't like that. Yeah, I don't know. Is it? Yeah, very strange. Or he, or he just yeah didn't. Or he skimmed the bit when he was talking about like the Vormi being a non-human race. You know, because mm. I see them almost. They're almost sort of akin to like um, Mackens little people and things like that. They're sort of yeah. you know like the 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 Chocho. Yeah, the Chocho and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, precisely. It's uh, they're sort of you know a dead end of evolution almost. You know. So my question that I mentioned earlier is why didn't they just burn the body, and would that have made any difference? I don't think it made any difference if he's a bubbling ball of plot of protoplasm under there. You know, <laughs> but I thought that as well. I was thinking that oh, why not why not burn it all? You know. Perhaps there was a, a, a religious thing, you know. Again, different mm, cultures yeah. have different takes. So some cultures will cremate. Some cultures are against cremation because the body is going to be resurrected on Judgment Day. Indeed. And so perhaps there, it was that sort of thing playing into it. Uh, because there are cemeteries there, right? Yeah. You know, they're, they're mentioned. So I guess burial is the, the standard practice. Yeah, it must be because, I mean, they do mention priests and, and all the rest of it so it is obviously a sort of secular society so yeah it will be it'll be down to religious tradition whatever they believe to be the sort of end game so to speak that you know well there's an interesting thing their religious beliefs were the cause of their downfall so, yeah. uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> very smith <laughs> yes <laughs> that's very clark yes, ashton smith absolutely. Right, yes. I just want to quick, very quickly mention uh, Piacula, oh, yes. because it's actually uh, quite relevant to this point. Piacula means making or requiring atonement. Interesting. Never heard that word before. But if you think about it, pia, pious. Of course, of course, yeah. Piety, pious, yeah. Piety, yeah. Excellent. So, yeah, and I like these sort of stories where, again, you know, it could be reduced to a, a sort of monster story. Uh, quite obviously, there's a very clear <laughs> monster. There's a hero with a sword, but we get something totally different with Smith. You can never tell where they're going at the start of the story. Well, if this had been Howard, it had been, it had been clattering steel and roars of battle and you this, know. this would have been the slithering shadow right or, or zuthal of the dusk where he, he fights Indeed. he fights a shot off basically and very barely manages to survive only thanks to his female companion so that would have been that kind of story yeah. but uh but they don't even get to fight this thing it's just too powerful and they do the sensible thing in that situation <laughs> i can just you know, i can just picture the scene in my head you know they'd look at the creature They'd look down at their pitchfork or billhook or whatever they've got, then look back at the creature and just go, I oh, sod this, I'm off. <laughs> I was thinking of moving anyway. Yeah, yeah. Property prices must have plummeted, eh? Yeah. 
Here's like, hey, a nice little village down the road. Fuck her there. You can see the Daily Express headline. Oh, God. Even worse, the Daily Mail. Can you imagine? Oh, oh, <laughs> Property prices plummet. Yeah. Okay, so now we don't have too much in the letters about this. There's a couple of mentions, and I think you might have uh, looked at one already in the publication. So this is from Smith to Lovecraft, April the 2nd, 1930. Ah, nice. So that's when, that's when he wrote the synopsis. So so that's about a year before he wrote it. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly it. It's actually what he, he describes it. By the way, I think of adding to the Hyperborean mythology by writing a tale to explain why Jungle Take and Comorium was deserted. The tale will be told by the public headsman of Comorium and will relate how he was compelled to behead a certain notorious outlaw seven times and how this outlaw, who was connected with Sasogua on his mother's side and also had a very peculiar subhuman strain in his ancestry, managed to leak or ooze from the tomb on each occasion and reappear on the streets of Comorium till after the seventh reappearance the population migrated in a body, and Athamaeus the headsman, albeit somewhat regretfully, since this was the one failure of a long and honourable career, gave up the hopeless job and followed them. The tale should make a rollicking hellraiser. Yours in the Black Mass, C-A-S. Nice. <laughs> so it's interesting that he's consciously adding to the mythology there, isn't it? Because that's not something you often see in Smith. No. And the other thing I took for that was we've got that connection with Sothogua, so that's the nameless spawn side. But then the peculiar subhuman strain in his ancestry, that's where I'm picturing that connection with the, the serpent people mm. who, who crop up against King Cole and all yeah. that. Well, maybe he just means the Vormi. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah, because he was Vormi as well. Yeah. Either works. It's, <laughs> it's cool either way, you know, it's one of them. Or both. or both. Well, this is Perhaps it. It's a this is this is it's a weird tale. <laughs> it's a yeah. mix. We don't need to know all the details, and actually filling in them blanks yourself is what makes them so much fun. <laughs> uh, and we then get another mention a little later on. Uh, this is to Lovecraft on the oh, or fifteenth to twenty third of February nineteen thirty one. So best part of a year later, from the vault of Tomeron, catacombs of the Ptolemides. <laughs> It is a week or so since I wrote the above. In the interim, I have drafted a tale from the Camorian myth cycle, The Testament of Athamaeus, which I've probably mentioned to you as being among my tentatives. I guess you won't wonder that Camorian was deserted when you read the explanation of the raison d'etre. In my more civic moods, I sometimes think of the clean-up which an entity like Nagathin Zaum would make in a modern town. Hmm. I really think he, or it, is about my best monster to date, it would be nice if I ever get to the book cover stage to publish a separate volume of tales under some such title as the Book of Hyperborea. This primal continent seems to have been particularly subject to incursions of outsideness, more so in fact than any of the other continents and terrene realms that lie behind us in the time stream. But I have heard it hinted in certain obscure and arcane prophecies that the far future continent called Gnidron by some and Zothik by others, which is to rise millions of years hence in what is now the South Atlantic, will surpass even Hyperborea in this regard, and will witness the intrusion of things from galaxies not yet visible, and worse than this, a hideously chaotic breaking down of dimensional barriers, which will leave parts of our world in other dimensions, and vice versa. When things get to that stage, there will be no telling where even the briefest journey or morning stroll might end. <laughs> Yours in the service of the old ones, Clark Ashton. Nice. So, yeah, he's, it's like he's already planning out. Is I think sort of you know I'm going to go even more bonkers with it. You know, <laughs> it's the sort of that's the sort of process I have. <laughs> you know, I'm going to do this, and it's going to follow on from that, but it's going to be even more ridiculous. <laughs> and I like the way that's presented. It's not a uh, oh, I've had this great idea and mm. this and that. It's like, this is what's going to happen in the future. <laughs> you know? It's like a story, isn't it? That's what I like about these letters. Yeah. They're, they're living it, aren't they, in that sense? It's yeah. strange because there's such a difference between like the letters between 
Smith and Lovecraft and the letters between Lovecraft, uh, Smith and Durleth or Smith and Loveman. Mm. Because those letters, they are like talking about his life and, and all the rest of it and job and work and things like that. Whereas Lovecraft and Smith, it's like they're telling each other stories. Yes, yes, totally. You know, yeah. they're in character almost, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's very strange. It, it, it so. is. It, I mean, when we said the return addresses and everything else, it's like they're keeping up this... Uh, this play all the way through. Yeah, it's a, it's a very playful correspondence, yeah. which it seems to contrast with Robert E. Howard, where they had lots of arguments about the nature of civilization, and that seemed uh, scholarly, I guess, with the small s. But this just seems like fun all the time. Yeah. And it's like, love, like Smith and Durleth, they, they tend to bitch a lot. Mm. <laughs> they spend a lot of time moaning <laughs> and picking apart episodes of uh, issues of weird tales and things like that you know and we do get a response from lovecraft this is on the 26th of march 1931 and this is from the vale of nath the hour of the opening of the underburrows dear clark ashton needless to say i enjoyed the enclosures to the limit and i'm vastly grateful for permission to retain the testament of athemaeus that is certainly a masterpiece of its genre and ought to form a highly important item in the Camorium cycle. I surely hope Wright will look favourably upon it. I'm given a glance in mention to Camorium and the early companions of Sothogua in my Antarctic thing. Mm. What I like about that is obviously that's a reference to the mountains of madness, yeah. but Antarctic thing. Yeah. <laughs> nice. That's a bit of a premonition there, isn't it? It is, isn't it? <laughs> it is, yeah. Though the general cast of the opus is semi scienty fictional. And then he goes on to mention in his next letter, because obviously he heard that, uh, that Wright had passed on the story. Wright is dot, 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 just old Farnsworth. Eternally the same. He'll be asking for Athamaeus all over again before long. This anti cannibal complex makes the outlook for my new Antarctic horror look a bit bad. In my tale, men are eaten. In fact, their flesh is cut out, sorted, and packed for transportation. <laughs> Although the butchers and eaters are not human beings or anything that ought normally to be alive on the same earth with human beings. Before long, it would be too daring to write of a lion that kills and eats a man. Modernity does have such delicate tastes. Oh, nice. <laughs> That's a line. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting, isn't it? Because I wonder what you'd make of today's films where, you you know, there's graphic depictions of people being, well mutilated yeah. in all sorts of ways yeah. as, as entertainment. I wonder um, what you make of the Saw movies, for example. Yeah, yeah. And all that, the, you know, the whole torture porn cycle, you know, things like Hostel and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, it, it's not saying this stuff is too graphic, is he, or this is too gory. It's mm. quite the opposite. So, interesting. <laughs> I wonder what he'd made of Cannibal Holocaust. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know what Wright would have made of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's what I mean, yeah. yeah I mean, yeah, right, yeah. 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 So, yeah, that's uh, pretty much it for the letters. Right. Well, I believe we've had a message from one of our regular contributors. Yes, it's Tobias Nielsen sending in a message. And uh, last time, because of holidays and various things, we didn't have a chance to do an episode. So we put up some readings. And one of the readings was The Revenant by Smith. And Tobias kindly wrote in with this comment. Salutations and praise. First of all, all the best to you in the Innsmouth Literary Festival. I truly hope you get the best out of it, even with the unruliness of the Iron Horse. <laughs> yeah, there is a, a train strike called for the day, but, you know. Yes. That aside, uh, I bet the Deep One cruise ships look like a mighty good choice after all now, don't they? Deep One <laughs> cruise ships never look like a good choice. Anyway, thank you for that. Well, I don't know. If you're a deep one, I think they'd probably be brilliant. Well, that's true. Yeah. I'm talking from a very limited perspective, I guess. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. I fully understand that all this has put your regular podcast output on pause, and I'm happy to hear the readings you managed to provide us. This brings me to my question. On listening to the three CAS poems you read on Strange Shadows, I couldn't help but notice a remarkable resemblance between Revenant, which was the poem, and HPL's short story, The Outsider. Now, I don't know the precise timeline between the two, but do you have any idea if the one might have inspired the other? And do you know if there's ever been something written between the two authors about it? Or have I just gone suitably mad and hear patterns where there are none? Well, the answer to that <laughs> second part is probably yes, 
but then you don't have to be mad to be here, but it does help a lot. <laughs> and uh, I believe, Tim, you've got some information on the first part of that question. Indeed, yeah. There was a communication between Smith and Lovecraft, um, postmarked the 15th of August 1933. Now, I'm going to have to read out the return address. It's from Lovecraft, right? It's from the Cyclopean Ruins of Shog. Hour of the lambent glow around the sealed door. Oh, beautiful. Nice. <laughs> I'm going to start a little bit further on just because he, he goes he, he goes in full-on Lovecraft style here. And now let me thank you most overflowingly for that splendid new set of drawings. Ea Shubnigarath, Nyag, that face in black, those eyes, God, young and brobs, you know, Young Brobst and my aunt both share my admiration for this batch. One of the pictures affords an especially good example of Clark Ashtonic vegetation, the poisonous flora of Zikarp and Klasach Hog. It certainly delights me to have my collection augmented by these powerful specimens. Now he goes on to say, uh, I'm now looking forward most eagerly to Handor, the fragmentary outline of which is tremendously alluring. Revenant for which I am infinitely grateful, is a significant piece of work recalling the midnight magic of Ebony and Crystal and the Star Treader. It evokes a black opiate pageantry of inconceivably vast, ancient and terrible things. I've just lent it to Galpin, whose opinion will certainly not depart far from my own. So yeah, Lovecraft read it and uh, was a fan. So there you go. Excellent, excellent. Because there's quite a gap between the two, you were saying, yeah. as well. I think it was uh, outside of 21. Well, it was one of his early ones, wasn't it? Was it was quite early, yeah. And and Revenant was over 10 years later, so... Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I'm, I'm going to reread the two again at some point over the next week or so. And uh, it might be an interesting discussion we can have on, on similarities. Mm. Uh, I also wonder if listeners can alert us to any other sort of similar uh, settings where you think one story might have influenced another or a poem in particular. We've not really covered Smith's poetry as such. Obviously, we've got a lot more of the story to work through. Yep. But uh, may maybe we'll do a, a bonus episode for patrons on some of the poetry as well. That's not a bad idea, yeah. Seeing as we only had <laughs> was it three adaptations to cover. <laughs> yes, yeah. I had immense fun with that, though. That was really good that, fun. That was good, yeah. <laughs> like our, our friends at Cast of Cthulhu have got a whole podcast on Lovecraft influence films. Yeah. Uh, if you did that for Smith, then it's basically one episode. But uh, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll maybe look, we'll look at some of his poetry next time. Yeah. So that's it for today. Thank you very much for joining us again, and I hope you enjoyed the testament of Athamius Athamius, or oh, oh, as much as we did. Oh, oh. Any uh, questions? pronunciation corrections suggestions and so on please do of course let us know you can post on our patreon page on our facebook page you can send us an email at innsmouth book club at outlook.com and uh, oh speaking of patrons i'd just like to welcome our latest patron sanjay matthew thank you very much for joining us if you'd like to jump on board as well check out our patreon site of course as a member you get bonus content for strange shadows and the Innsmouth Book Club. You get free entry to events such as the Innsmouth Literary Festival and more are being planned for next year. And you get your quarterly copy, a PDF of Innsmouth News. What are we covering next time, Tim? Uh, we're co covering a story which is completely new to me. I have no idea what it's about. It's called A Captivity in Serpens. All oh, right, I see it's quite a long story and it's another yeah. space one. It's our favorite captain. Volmar. Oh, is it Captain Douchebag again? Captain oh. Douchebag is back. Nice. <laughs> and his red shirts. Yeah. Yes. So we look forward to seeing how many red shirts he manages to get rid of in the first <laughs> chapter. <laughs> All right. Hope you can join us for that. Thanks again for listening, everyone. With that, it's goodbye from me, Rob Poynton. And it's goodbye from me, Tim Mendes. <laughs>